Well, hello there, Terrible Warriors, to a, another special episode here on a Thursday as we meet the makers, where we get a chance to sit down and meet the people who make the games that we like to play. And you have already met one of these makers before. Not only uh, was he on here to talk about Necrobiotic, another successfully kickstarted game, uh, but you have heard his voice many a time in the last few episodes in our Simbaroom campaign as Vaird, the reluctant witch, guiding our siblings to the mountain of the Titans. Welcome back, Mitch Wallace. Hello, hello. Good to be here. And you have brought with you yet another maker for us to meet, Pete Petrusha, from yeah. the Chew role-playing game Kickstarter, which you two are both uh, a part of and have put out, and you have met your goal. Congratulations! But there are still 28 days to go, and we are here talking about that Kickstarter now. We are uh, almost in real time. This is almost a live show, because we're talking the very evening before I put a podcast out, and like Simbaroom, <laughs> we recorded back in August, and we still have like eight more episodes to release. So there is some tiny shenanigans happening around on this podcast feed. But uh, this is uh, is at the time that it's released, uh, right here at the beginning of October. Pete, welcome to the Terrible Warriors. Before we get into Chew and get to learn all about this cool game and its setting and its system and, and all that stuff, I want to get to know you as well uh, and and um, how perhaps you and Mitch know each other, but also what uh, got you into tabletop because everyone's got a slightly different entryway. There's, there's some similarities, certainly, uh, but this is, um, this is a tough industry to crack uh, and to, and to, and to get it, making it work. So what, uh, tell me your, tell me your beginning, your origin, your character creation story. How, how did your, <laughs> how did you write up that first character sheet? How did you start sure. uh, here in this hobby? What, what is it about the TT and the RP and the G's that, that hooked you uh, enough that you're, um, you're, 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 putting your neck on the chewing chopping block here to get this game out. <laughs> yeah. So I was a game store rat. So I found my first real game store beyond like comic books as a kid um, playing magic, the gathering when I was probably like 14 or 15. And that got me into game stores, game slash comic stores. And I saw people in the back. Uh, we did have a private room eventually, but in the beginning they had long tables and there was always a role-playing game group because they had one GM who ran like five days a week, who was a, a living legend, if you will. <laughs> uh, I don't think you'd ever hear of the person, but his name was Joe Jekenthal III, which was oh, such an amazing name. What a name. Very regal. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that he's been blamed for many crimes in our lives because it was one of those names you could always <laughs> revert back to. Like, it wasn't me, it was Joe Jekenthal yeah, III. Is, yeah, yeah. It's not that he is the third in the line of names. That this <laughs> is the third time he has had to change his identity. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a wonderful a human being. But yeah, yeah, he, um, him with the, uh, the game store was called City of Atlantis. And we had, you know, a lot of titles, which was cool over time. Uh, you know, they were one of those stores that tried, they like would stock new games, not just like, you know, a lot of stores these days, you know, kind of pick a market and then they stick real tightly in it. Uh, so we were, we were lucky that like Shadowrun and Legend of the Five Rings and Vampire and Werewolf and D&D &D and different editions of these games. Um, and it was in the late 1990s. So it was before the, you know, the D20 and before really a lot of the indie games. Um, so we got a big variety and we tried a lot of games over time. And that that's the early, early story is my fifth, uh, my 12 year old saw the Shadowrun second edition book at a model shop that my dad took me to. And I was like, dad, what is that? Can I have that? What is it? And he was like, no, that's $25 and it's like two inches thick and you can't read. So no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So very early on, you were already quite used to flexing around with different settings and rules. You weren't uh, a ride or die on any one particular game type. I had a lot of love for Shadowrun because it was my introduction. And, and there'd be years of actually owning books before I actually knew what it was. I didn't, I didn't know what a role-playing game was for years. So you're, one, you're, one of the few people, you're one of the few people that I will have ever met that probably knows how to figure out the uh, algebra required to do a magic cast in shadow because we played friggin' second yeah. edition i think it was That's what I, that was my book yeah and, and yeah. I, I i couldn't i actually 
couldn't create a character <laughs> in that game so badly that I just played one of the pre-made ones lifted directly from the page because I'm like, I, I can't figure this out. I don't know. And we, we even, even trying to find like dice rollers or any kind of online tool, they were sure. all running on. We had to get like a DOS emulator <laughs> to get Can it you to imagine? operate because it was, I it was, was predated everything. I was 12 years old and I saw an equation that was advanced algebra that was for vehicle car collision. <laughs> that was like way yeah. beyond. Like what Shadow you're talking about. intense. It's not messing mm-hmm. around. The spells are like average. You know, they are, they have like algebra, but they're like average. But like the car collision, it was oh, like no. algebra in four different That's quadrants we that you had to, to do in some We weren't order allowed to hack. We weren't allowed to go to cyberspace. We weren't allowed to have any vehicles. And if we did, there would be like a time lapse to after the vehicle. And then we're at the destination. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's funny yeah. what you know now, not to make this all about Shadowrun, but it, it is such a game of specialists. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if you're a, a casual group of people like like we were at a game store and you're like, oh, let's play this game. We play every game a little bit like D&D, like party oriented. Sure. You, you suddenly realize, well, this doesn't work because like you are the hacker. And for you to do your part, you actually kind of like leave us. Yeah. And you yeah. are the you are the pe- you're the sniper. So, again unless you're the really bad sniper that like walks through and kills everyone with a knife and like a handgun, you're probably up there like waiting and yeah, watching. You're across the street on the roof, keeping yeah, an eye yeah. out. So yeah. real quickly, you realize this game sucks and it's not the, it's kind of not the game. It's like, you don't realize that you're supposed to not play it like D and D. It's like, the it's consequence of the genre that they're going for, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. like it's the type, it's that type of heist where you yeah. are just broken up into different roles in different places. And, and, you know, to its credit, you know, games have become a lot more cinematic these days. And I think oh, we're yeah. going to really talk about that with Forge in the Dark and Chew. Yeah. Um, whereas in the 90s, it was still very much still trying to simulate as if it was somehow real and trying to capture <laughs> very true, very yeah. gritty realist. Like it, it was it, it hadn't we're still holding on to the war game origins of tabletop and still mm-hmm. trying to replicate the simulation of that and and you know all the power to you if if you want to do a simulation these games can do that but if you want to do a kick-ass collaborative story that you wrap up in four hours with you and your buddies and 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 you're all laughing about that great moment and it feels like a movie in your mind the simulation isn't always going to achieve that is it no no not at all and because the four hours right like that, that simulation play, it almost, re- well, one, it requires like the days before cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> when people couldn't find you, you could disappear for you days. You have to commit to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you, right. That's, that's the, um, you know, you've, you've probably looked at Burning Wheel because it's such a classic for like the indie, our indie movement of the, the modern day. But like, it's laughable when you open it up and you look and it's like, we expect short games to be six to eight hours of like <laughs> oh, eh, six God. to eight I sessions. I don't have that. Like a, a burning <laughs> wheel, that mouse guard if it falls under that umbrella, right? Yep. Yeah. And yep. like this is eight hours. I mean, even if, even, even before I had no time in my life as an adult and I was just coming off of school, you get done school at what, three or four o'clock. And then, you know, you, you need to eat and then you meet with your friends and then eight hours? No, that's not happening. You got two. You have well, two, you know, maybe three. Right? And and then if you got the weekend, you've got eight hours. That's assuming your parents let you do something that wasn't violin lessons on a Saturday sure. night. Sure, yeah. I bring it up because that's like an indie forefather, right? Yeah. Like that's the low, the early 2000s speaking I mean, there's to board us games today. like that, like Twilight Imperium that are like, you know, set aside a 12-hour day. <laughs> to play yeah. your game which i've never completed no in one 12 hours. there is no <laughs> person who has ever completed that game and if they do no one then they, they're also saying they went to woodstock and that they were at the yeah. rolling stone show at the shoe and yeah no it it didn't happen but the long story obviously <laughs> from the game store roots is that you know yeah. i disappear for years and i come back but i've always gone to gen con and origins because i'm in the midwest i'm by chicago so like since 99 i've pretty much been at like every gen con wow so um yeah, I would always buy like two games. In the beginning, I'd buy a bunch, but eventually I realized, hey, every year you can leave with two games because then those two games, you'll, you'll actually read them and you'll yeah. try to run them every year. And I've always had this healthy uh, sort of appetite for a lot of RPGs because I love them. You know, I love them. And as coming from my game store roots, I, I love the community that came out of role-playing games. I love that these we have these wonderful stories and these memories that like... I, I lost one of my friends from my, my group, my gaming group when we were like teens, he died at 24 and you just realize how valuable these things are. Cause like the stories you have are these unique memories and bonds. And then like, when you lose someone, it's like, now they're just mine. 
And it's a mm-hmm. weird sort of understanding of like how fickle life is, but also like how everything matters as much as it matters to you. Like your memories are gold, whether it's traveling or weightlifting or, you know, whatever is important to you. And like a uh, long time, you know, RPG role player escapist uh, gone to um, playing tabletop, you know, it's just been like something miraculous and you can really play it at whatever amount of depth you want, whether you want full immersion and escapism, mm-hmm. or if you just want to like, Hey, let's just fuck around for a couple hours. Like, and that's, you can do it to taste, which is also cool. Yeah, it can scale to what you need it to be. And, yeah. uh, and, and it's that collaborative aspect that, that uh, there was a freedom in that when, you know, I, I wasn't playing magic, the gathering or, or Warhammer games. I kind of couldn't afford to, uh, but I could afford to, jump in on a game of D&D with my friends in high school. Oh, yeah. Because all I needed, I didn't. I, I, I picked up a, my first set of dice and paper and pencil, printed them out, and away we went. And uh, I, I never read the rules. I didn't have the rules. I just trusted that they <laughs> weren't uh, conning me through the whole thing. And and it was just so interesting. And uh, 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 interestingly, that D&D group then turned into an improv team. <laughs> and, oh, that's wonderful. And then that group got recruited by a teacher to be like, hey, you want to play Dungeons and Dragons after school? And that was the first time we actually played like advanced Dungeons and Dragons and went into that. It was like seeing for the first time how someone outside of our group played these games with rules. <laughs> and, sure, yeah. And like, and it was hard and it was challenges and it was such a different um, uh, feel because I, I didn't have like you, uh, uh, like a, a store or conventions it was it was yeah. very much an island of of interest and uh and then we we, we went one time to uh know, some church basement to join in with a group and uh and they were so mad at us because we didn't have like our rations written down we didn't have like the exact we amount of experience play that we like they play. yeah and we're like no we just we're just we're we're the, we're we're on night boat we 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 sail around like grieving <laughs> we, we got our we got our frog who helps like pilot the ship and they're like no, no, you gotta, you gotta play, you gotta play by these ledgers and you gotta, it was so different and it was so, it was so interesting on just how many different ways to approach the exact <laughs> same thing. I love, I love what you said there too. Cause like I, there was a Pathfinder game I played a couple of years ago and it was because I was going to local stores before I became a game designer to like kind of see what kind of other people were in my community. Like who was out in my, you know, like who could I reach? What gaming groups could I build? Like who, who could I put together? And yeah. I, I found myself in Pathfinder society at one point, just trying to find players. Right. And there was one GM who ran, you know, was the structured like uh, uh, adventure society. I can't remember Pathfinder society. I think it was. And this one adventure, we totally derailed it. Like we derailed it, but like we had a blast. Like we were just supposed to walk in this house and there's supposed to be traps and it's haunted or whatever. And like, we were like walking outside, looking at the windows. We were like messing with the people inside. Yeah. And afterwards you could just tell that the person like just, they got really frustrated by the end. And then when it was over, you know, even like kind of just talked down to all of us for a minute. And we just all laughed because we had a blast. Like, yeah. like they just, they didn't even realize like, we could touch each other. We were like that close. And like five, six people had a blast. Yeah. A lesson for all GMs. Your story doesn't matter. The thing you've prepared actually is not the most important yeah. thing at all. What <laughs> What is important is being a fan of your players. And if they want to go around and do home alone in your house <laughs> on Haunted Hill, um, then you got to let them. You got to follow through with that because at the end of the day, you're you're they're they're not playing your story <laughs> you're you're all playing a story together that exists yeah. somewhere in the middle of the table that no one really has final control over which is which is i don't know that's that's the addictive quality for me is you don't mm-hmm. know what's in the story until you start playing the game even when mitch like we were playing Simbrome in august and yes we were playing a pre-written campaign but there were so many different ways that things were going to play out and there yeah. was no way to know until you play it. And yeah, exactly. And, and you just, you have to do it. You have to, you have to go in and, and do it yourself. Um, Pete, I feel like we know you now. We have met oh, you. Oh, good, good. Welcome yeah. to Meet the Makers. So <laughs> tell me about uh, Chew the Role Playing Game because that's what we're here to talk about. It's kickstarted right now. It just started this week and yeah. it's going through the rest of October and uh, congratulations on already hitting your first goal. But like, we know that that's just like, that's, that's the strategy. Now you gotta, you gotta hit that gate right out the button. And then, uh, and now, it, now the campaign begins because you want to start climbing yeah. up that ladder and going through those goals and making it really grow. Mm-hmm. 20, so 
two, five, twenty. So we we've hit six stretch goals. That's amazing. <laughs> we funded hit six stretch goals, and it's been you know it's day two. Well, day three. Sorry. So by the time you listen to this, sorry, there's a little. I broke the fourth wall. No, no, oh no, it's <laughs> off by twelve hours. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully by the time you listen to this, there's even more than that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ticking that's, up. That's always a hope. So yeah, so chew. Okay, so. I'm going to get this started, but I, I want Mitch. I want some input from yeah, Mitch. Mitch is going to be exploding from, over let, here. Let, let Pete grab some water and, and catch a breath. Mitch, <laughs> uh, welcome back. We've got, hey. you've got, you've got a new sign above you because you got a new game that you're doing Beautiful. And, mm-hmm. and it looks great. You were telling me about this and, and I had to put on like a polite face because unfortunately I had never heard of the image comic that it was based on. Uh, I didn't know about this. I am not sure. cool enough or yeah. plugged into the cultural zeitgeist enough. Um, so you, you were an island. I'm 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 living alone uh, in a deserted <laughs> island of my mind. Uh, Mitch, tell us about what is what is Chew and what is Chew the role playing game. Where like wh- like you're coming. I'm I'm. This is actually an opportunity for you to come to my listener because I'm the layperson now. I have no. I don't even really. I've never played a Forge in the Dark game. I am. I am a. You might as well be on some like boomer podcast right now because I am <laughs> so out of the loop with this. Uh, oh but, yeah. So but I'm excited. Uh, I'm always excited by anything you bring to my table. So, <laughs> <laughs> what is a role playing game, Nick? Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> oh man, this is whew, this is gonna be a R? long journey. What does the R stand for? <laughs> oh God. Uh, uh, so Chu uh, is a comic uh, written by John Layman and the art done by Rob Guillory. Um, John Lehman continues to do Chew, but with a U, uh, while uh, Rob Guillory is currently working on Farmhand, uh, which is his personal project, which is really cool. But yeah, Chew is just this amazing and wonderful story about uh, Tony Chu, uh, who is an FDA agent after America and, and everyone else has dealt with a chicken pandemic. And so the FDA has gotten a lot of power because of it. And so uh, in this world where like, you know, the, the Food and Drug Administration is, is kind of like the FBI uh, or the CIA of, of, of the day um, and food related powers are rising up. It's just this world of absurdity, weirdness and darkness um, where you don't really know what what is in store next. But food related. Yeah. Powers? Yeah. Like the. So this wasn't just a bird flu. This was. Yeah. Something else is going on. Yeah, in and it's 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 kind of obvious as you go through the comic that food related powers have always been around, uh, but it wasn't until recently that people really started chatting about them. And you know, when and, the world goes to hell, right? Yeah, everyone goes out to party. So in, in a chicken bucket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the main character has this ability that whatever he ingests, uh, he gets psychic impressions concerning it. Um, which has really helps him out uh, as an FDA agent because, you know, if there's a dead body, he gets to lick it. Or, um, you know, if there's a, whatever, you're, like a chicken-related thing, he, he can eat it and figure out, like, what it was been up to, who cooked it, and all sorts of things. Um, and because chicken is illegal, um, it's just kind of all of this, like, oh, it's like being on a roller coaster that smells like chicken, <laughs> and you're enjoying it the whole way. You're just like... <laughs> Why does this roller coaster so smell it's, like chicken? It's, it's a noir crime world at a uh, Popeyes. I, yeah, yeah, and definitely less noir and more. I don't, I don't know what genre I would, I would put it. Maybe I think noir is probably the closest we'll ever get. So, yeah, the, the hard part that it's hard <laughs> to explain. So it's to anyone an absurd who hasn't read the comics. crime yeah. noir gumshoe procedural. And it's action packed. Mm-hmm. It's okay. ridiculously yeah. hilarious. Um, and it's be- become kind of undefinable with that with that whole thing. <laughs> that must be so easy for you to sell the idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah right? it's this just... undefinable, ineffable, amazing story setting. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the, the president. The selling point is I'm it's weird, potent, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it's dark and weird. You can get that far. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like in in one scene, uh, you'll have uh, someone who has this power of uh, being like a marshmallow. 
Uh, and so just bouncing around and like they're chasing after him because it's like this stupid little villain. Uh, and then the next one, you're like mourning over the death of uh, a comrade in like this very surreal, uh, picturesque uh, image of, of the characters uh, at a grave, at a funeral. Um, and so you kind of go back and forth. And it's one of those things because it's like horror and comedy go well together, but it's really hard to do um to make it a nice pb and j sandwich uh it has to be spread just right or else everyone's gonna hate <laughs> you it. know what i like to say and then some of my friends are, are like dude nobody knows what that means is like the wire meets the boys yeah yeah <laughs> because it's got some of that police procedural but mm-hmm. like some of like the shenanigans of like the people you're really who you care about are the people like the cast like and chew you're the quirky investigators that are vulnerable and over the top because even as weird as the boys get it's still real for the characters that are in it as exactly. absurd as the situations become and gory like the boys yeah. brings that extreme like it brings that like somebody punches a hole through your body everyone's like trying to explain why one person ran through your girlfriend but all you're really mad is you you're like my girlfriend's gone everyone's just like oh sorry superhero ran through it it's okay yeah. and like my whole life is now consumed by the need for people to understand i lost my girlfriend yeah um so yeah it's got this extreme it's like a police procedural you know it, it starts with that base but it's very much like like these primetime shows where like the case is almost like the, the movie of the week, the yeah, monster mm-hmm. of the week. And it's really the, the journey of these quirky characters who also happen to be agents of the FDA and in weird situations with weird crimes going on. And for them sometimes to be juggling like, yeah, but I'm trying to get my, my, my three-year-old to like recital. And like, that's, what's important. I, I got the videotape and I keep, I've been trying yeah. to return it for seven days, but my job and they keep flying me everywhere. And like, it becoming about the videotape, like for the players, like I just try to get the damn videotape back. So it's got quirky over the top characters with serious jobs and absurd situations. And if every session doesn't feel a little like Tropic Thunder, we fail. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, it's like and a we weird ran. blend of the absurd with the mundane yeah. where <laughs> you have this over the top, silly scenario, but the stakes are real grounded yeah. Um, maybe a little basic, but <laughs> but mm-hmm. well, but but surrounded by everything around it, like it's 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 real and important to the character to not let their kid down for this thing that yeah. they have to do for yeah. them. But you're also dealing with this bouncing marshmallow that's making you late for it's being it's at definitely that like dinner. It's got elements of real life, right? Like we're all juggling like our health, our work life balance, but it's so absurd that it's funny and ridiculous. And one thing that to, to pick on is the food powers, right? The food powers, like nobody's invulnerable. Nobody can fly. They're very like oddly specific. It's like if you and I share a meal, well, then I can read your surface thoughts. If you drink these edible foams that I put because I'm a barista, I can suggest things. If I wear spaghetti on my head, I'm strong as strong as three men. Yeah. <laughs> but as long as it's there, if the meat, each meatball that falls, I lose one person's strength. Like they're just unique in the way that like they're not always things you can use all the time to be like superman they're they're often things that are like oh i could role play my way into making something neat happen and the player's like what are you doing and it's like oh it's a murder mystery and you're getting us all around the table so you could reveal what happened by us eating into the main entree and then the murderer will be at the table and they'll know we all know at the same time like <laughs> so let's let's take a step back we we i think we've you've helped as strange as it is helped describe what the chew <laughs> universe is like so what yeah. is the table top experience going to be cuz certainly someone's listening to this and they're going to back this game they're going to get it you know this Pete, by going and buying those two games a year when you're going to gen con if you're the one who's going to buy a brand new game that no one's ever heard of in a setting that few people you know a niche setting that has like a cult following so you can't even assume that your players are going to know they're gonna you're gonna run the game if you buy this game <laughs> yeah so what is it like to uh bring chew to the table and run it like is this i mean obviously i know the answer is going to be yes it's accessible but the the idea like how have you found introducing this game if it's the first time someone is introduced to chew through this rpg um what what is that what is that experience like for the for the game master 
uh, or whatever term you're using for the game master in this? It's got a very simple, very visual, very in your face, like basic investigative design. So it, it fits a lot of the tropes that we want in a role playing game, basic, a lot of the basic tropes, and then let's yeah. just expand. Like it starts with a case. You know, that's like an adventure, a mission, just like most. Um, it starts with a uh, supervisor who probably is going to speak to you like you're a piece of dirt um, or that's going to be over the top, soft and passive. It's going to be one of these ridiculously extreme bosses <laughs> to give you the best and the worst of that, because your boss is almost like the villain when you have a job because everybody else goes away eventually, but they never leave. It's kind of reminding me a little bit of like the setup for a paranoia game. Where sure. you have your yeah. your briefing and then you're sent off on your troubleshooting mission, um, but not as slapstick as paranoia. <laughs> yeah. And then we give you a cork board, which is like a whiteboard. But the idea is that you put post-its nice. on it. So it starts you with a pink one that says this is the case. And then you're looking in the base game as agents of the FDA. You're looking for a suspect, a method and a motive. And we're going to, in the case file, which will probably be described to you, we're going to slap down a couple yellow post-its that give you some leads, right? There, some of them are going to be ridiculous, unwarranted, or may just even be like you know, just a joke. Like literally they're sending you on a joke because they want you to fail. Um, yeah. But some of them will have some meat on it. And what's going to happen is, is that the players, by how they choose, what they choose to investigate and how well they roll, right? With, with what they're doing, they're actually leading us to what the end result is. We don't say that necessarily it's the, um, they're going to get to the root of the problem because that's the part that it doesn't, ha- it doesn't matter. They're the FDA. They're like Homeland Security after 9-11. Nobody's going to tell them that they accused the wrong person for years. <laughs> and that person will be so deep in a hole. No one will ever hear them scream. Yeah. Right? So they can phone one case in and the next one could be like near and dear to the heart. And we like that they're going to look at it from different perspectives. Like they don't all have to be bought in. You know, like most games, it's like, oh, we're going to save the princess. We're going to get revenge. Every case could just be work. Some people are like, yeah. You ever played Dogs actually, in the like, Vineyard? Lawn. Old, old, oh, early game from like early 2000s. Oh, I've, I've danced around it. I've been wanting to check that so out. So we, 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 we played that for a while and, um, I mean, Dogs in the Vineyard it has got um, uh, an, an interesting and complicated history, even with the creator, and it's no longer available to be purchased because of some of the themes that were in the game. But at its core, you're playing these kids who are being sent into towns to solve problems, and they're being told, here's a book and here's a gun. Go do it. And because of their station, no one can really challenge them. And no one can, except unless they're another watchdog, they can't really... Uh, uh, hold you accountable or or challenge your decisions and it kind of sounds a little bit like here with this fda in this in this universe your description well, sounds really spot on yeah no no one can no one can call you out on it if you're making the bad call because you're so far above the ladder and there isn't really anyone holding you accountable there's no parallel uh checks and balances that are well no you can't do this because these this group is going to get in your way there's no one else you're you are separate from the the, the, the chain of command, as it were. And it, you're it over you here. In the real world to do things that, yeah, you wouldn't be able to get away with normally. And then, and then um, when you're done that case, you leave town, you go to a new town and sure. all your problems are left behind you. Right. And, and who, who do you have to answer to is you yeah. do have your supervisor and you have and your you team members. Like you have to answer yeah. to the people you're working with. Yeah. So one of the, I mean, and this is like in the weeds, right. But like, especially in prolonged play, like, as you talk to your supervisor at the end of every session and at the end of every case, you these lead to different performance ratings that you and your team have, which then can lead to you being transferred, demoted, promoted, getting more top clearance. Are the performance you know, like ratings more written by other players to other players? Uh, uh, in one way, yes. Uh, one way that one of my favorite things to do, and again, this is now we're talking about the end before the middle. But, <laughs> yeah. It's all right. We're, we're time travelers. <laughs> I, you know, I always try to put gratitude in my games. And what that is, is just simply like we all live busy lives yeah. and we love role playing. But we like as soon as it's over, like for 50 percent of us are already late to the next thing. Yeah. You know, we're already like or we're, we're lost in our headspace. We're like, OK, I got to go. I got to go. So trying to get back that time where we used to like hang out by the car or like, you you know, you should leave, but you don't leave. Um, I try to bake in like 
some part in the rules that says like, you must do this, which is talk about your friend, talk to your friends and tell them at least one thing that made you have a better time. Because these are the ways we want to end our games, but it's also like sometimes we just don't tell our, our friends yeah. like what was awesome. Uh, I love that. Like, you know the, the 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 safety toolkit that's out there, and one of the the tools that are in that kit is the stars and wishes yeah. uh, ability. This sounds like more in games are starting to just design these tools yeah. into the game, and that's really you know checking in and giving that kind of gratitude is also a safety tool to also confirm oh, sure. that we're yeah. all still having a good time and we're talking yeah you and, know and and it, it, it's not um you know it's designed to elevate the positives uh, yeah. and not necessarily highlight the negatives but it does give an opportunity to say i really like this i really wish we were going in this thing because you know yeah. my character has this unresolved thing that i would love to be able to explore more of and it's an indicator not just to the person running the game if it's all being done as part of the game for the other players to also indicate to each other oh i love it when you do this and well, I, you and really th want to keep doing that that's the critical one from from my design aspect that i believe is the most important a lot of times the game master and the players talk but the players don't tell each other so like it needs gratitude, to be a triangle not a not a mm -hmm. v yeah with yeah. the gratitude and it's probably because the game master talks to each player about the game and the players don't necessarily talk to each other about the game and you're trying to inspire that but yeah the player is responding in a positive way and like if you used a funny voice or if you just helped me make my character or you talk to me like a human being or you did some really funny ridiculous yeah. thing that made the session better any of these count and so in chew there's a part where you get experience for commendations or um reprimands which because you know you, you might be reprimanding this person for what they did to your boss it's still forward it's, progress even if it's but it's backwards. the player <laughs> saying i loved it when you yeah. did that even though my character has to you know it's a reprimand from the boss you're still getting the same yeah i love it like uh, we played spire uh last year on the podcast and inspire your characters advance whenever the city changes it does not say if the city changes in a good or a bad way so if you <laughs> fail and everything blows up and everything's under martial law and everyone hates you it still change it still counts it's still an advancement in the game so like even if even when you lose, you win in a tabletop game, right? That's just that's going to be the story today. And so it is I, the I, journey. I like that even like a reprimand or an accolade, um, mm -hmm. it, they're both advances in their yep. own way, right? Like they both rewarded. forward the story, even if it was a quote failure for because your character. If you know the comics, like the characters do get demoted to like traffic, they go to the PD, they go to the FDA, sometimes they get sent off. Sometimes oh, because the boss hates them. I don't know the comments, but you told me about The Wire, and that happens all the time with characters, and McNulty getting kicked off of uh, yep. the homicide, and he's just got to go off looking after unions over on the dock for a while on the boat. And it's our way of never mechanically hurting the character. Like, it's never like you're de-leveled or your stats go down. It's because we want, we're rewarding you for moving the story forward. Even if your performance ratings change, oh, so you have less access to stuff. But it's not any, anything that, like, it just changes how you would play it. Right. And now maybe it's fun because like you don't have access to anything. And now we can play with that. Right. Like suddenly you're in traffic. You have no intel. Nobody's going to come clean up your mess. You know, like if anything, they don't even think you're important. They give you a taser and a segue. You know, like, here you go. Good luck. And Stop that's just, and in a way that it resets the game, it refreshes what you're up to and it gives everyone, okay, you've been demoted, but that's, um, it, it's giving everyone a new opportunities to do yeah. things that they wouldn't have done in the previous situation. Not an essence strain. It's not a B level. It's nothing to like hurt your character. It's just more story. Yeah. yeah. Weird stuff is still going to happen, except now you have a segue. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Uh, I feel like we've shifted gradually from the world setting to the mechanics of the game. And so that brings me to the other side of what I want to talk about is that uh, I, I notice here uh, that it's a forged in the dark game, which forged is the, in the dark. Oh, it's the rule setting that was originally done through Blades in the Dark and has then spun off into their own spinoffs, but uh, certainly also a rule kit that is being used by other other creators mm -hmm. for Forge in the Dark uh, hacks, uh, for lack of a better term. Similar way to the way Powered by the Apocalypse games are all hacks of Apocalypse World uh, and, and the setting, the first design there. So why Forge in the Dark? Why? Because oh, you, you, you have the option of making your own system, mm -hmm. using all these other systems that are out there. Yeah. Um, what was it about Forge in the Dark that attracted you that felt like a really good match for two? And what so, is Forge in the Dark, too? Like... <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anyone to assume again. Yeah. 
Here, I'll start with Forge in the Dark, and then I'll kick some concepts off to Mitch, so Mitch can answer yeah, why they're yeah. cool for you. Because there's a lot of reasons. Mitch is being very patient over there, listening to our chat. I'm <laughs> chilling. <laughs> when, we, when we got the license and we talked to the creators, we were like, no, 100%, we're making our own game system. Because as game designers, generally speaking, you're like, nothing's going to do your story, your IP, your product, like, like its own game. Cause like, we need to, we need to cater and push all the buttons in the right direction that it, it's your game. Like it, yours, your game is chew. Yeah. Um, but along the way <laughs> we, we found that it was, it was a nice glove. It was warm and cozy. It didn't have any extra space. It wasn't too loose. It wasn't too tight, but yeah. Forge in the dark um, was based on powered by the apocalypse. Um, it was John Harper who made uh, for a lot of us in the scene, lady blackbird, but a lot of great one shot sort of like, short procedural two-page adventures also the creator of Aegon, uh which just recently got a second edition but uh blades in the dark was like hey i've been making games for a long time i make some pretty good games i really think powered by the apocalypse is rad but i would do these things to it and there, there's some osr and definitely like some procedural stuff that seems to be in john harper's wheelhouse like you know he likes the random generation tables and stuff um so it's a little bit of a love letter to Powered by the Apocalypse, taking a lot of the core greatness of like, you know, the three result levels. Like, so we always got like a large gap that's like success with a catch. Um, that's very fiction forward, you know, in the way that like we're talking, we're, we're giving a story, but we're not, we're, we're not leading the players. We're letting them lead the dance and we're kind yeah. of watching and letting it like unfold because about the journey. Um, it's got D6s, but it uses a die pool system that's a little bit different. It'll remind you of like inspectors. You just need one high result. Um, but yeah, it's very narrative based on your just what your role results are. Um, so like Powered by the Apocalypse people, it doesn't have moves like that. But your results are similar. And like, I understand it too. There's a lot of power in the players to be participating in the world building. At least in Blades in the Dark, there's mm-hmm. opportunities for you to retcon in the moment yeah. past events that then explain, oh, well, I do have the codes to this door because the previous night I was at a party and I overheard them talking and I slipped my hand and I got a mm-hmm. odd piece of paper and now I've got it and you can go and you go boop, 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 and you can get through. And, um, or, or like something like that, or, or I, an example of a friend told me they were running down a hallway and there's a dead end at the end of the hallway. Oh, well, the night before we set the charges and then yeah. blow the wall out. And you have uh, the ability to involve yourself in the GM's role at times in setting the scenes and resetting the scenes. It's a lot of player agency. And, uh, you have, uh, throwing you a have screwdriver to use a uh, wrestling term. Get specific tools that allow you resources, if you will, to enact player agency over the game master at times when you choose. Um, so yeah, Mitch, one of the things we love is how you can go dark, like chew, because you can resist. So that's a little bit of what you're talking about. Can you tell them, Mitch, about resistance? Oh yeah, I mean, like, uh, I mean, whenever anything comes up that you're like, eh, I don't like that. Uh, your boss Maybe is like, like somebody getting shot in the head or an arm yeah. shot, <laughs> getting severed yeah. in two by a pizza slicer, and like your entrails oozing oh, all yeah, over the ground. Oh yeah, we're dealing with the food industry, so everything is horrible. Yeah, exactly. What I'm like, trying to insert there is the GM can go as dark and as extreme and as far as they want, and at any point the player can then go, no. "Yeah, you know, I'm going to resist that. That's a lot. No, but you can have your cake and eat it too." Is the game? Master. Oh, so it's like a built-in X card that's like. I can baked go there. into the rules of the of the game. Well, and I, I should, way. The, obviously the caveat there is, you know, I can go there if it's like within the, the <laughs> yeah, within the safety like, mechanics safety. that we There's disclaimers and <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah, but yeah. I, the point is, like, I can talk about how the sniper was set up and shot you in the head, and then you can choose whether or not that happened, and then we can pay such. So, Mitch, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, and this happened in uh, Origins. Uh, someone was picking a lock, and uh, I said, "Well, you know, because he failed, you know, you know, resist getting your sh- your, uh, your 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 sh- uh, leg shot off." Um, and you know, unfortunately, like for for that, you could if they were successful, then yeah, maybe it just like burns their leg or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, they were uh, they they failed, so they ended up losing that leg. Um, but it kind of lets you as a GM kind of just throw out all this stuff, um, as everyone's enjoying the game. Uh, and then whenever your, your player is like, I don't like that. Like, 
this uh this boss is being a little too mean to me uh to my character uh and i want them to you know stop hurting my feelings and, and stuff like that or you know maybe i don't want my my ass to get kicked by a, a little uh, mashed potato fairy uh so i'm gonna resist uh because who, who would want that um and that's pretty much like that's it right there you you have an opportunity with your your players to uh create more of the story uh despite you know with the fact that your your characters are like i don't like that i want to resist this um, they got yeah. they have a resource so like in blades they have stress but in most forge in the dark games there's some iteration like we use appetite which is a lot yeah. like your drive to complete the case, to get to the bottom of it, your your energy levels. Um, and so when you resist, it will succeed. There's no question of not or, or not if it'll succeed. Mm-hmm. You just roll to see how much it costs you. Yeah, yeah. It, so it's just play, like players know this, right? Like that's the value of it is the player knows whatever you do to me, I can stop you in your tracks and be like, no, that doesn't happen. And at worst case scenario, it's going to be reduced. Like instead of I died, you know, like I will miraculously survive or it was a near miss or my arm got broken instead, but I, I only fell 10 feet to the next story instead of all the way off the building, yeah. you know, it's and just it's just about that. It, it has it. baked in player agency. Yeah. Um, you mentioned flashbacks in particular, which are blades likes the idea, you know, blades is a heist game. And we talked about Shadow in the beginning. So the heist scenario leads to a lot of players doing all this Mm -hmm. reconnaissance. Well, if you you want to do the legwork, yeah, you got to. Yeah. yeah. So if you want an action packed game, the problem is that a lot of times what happens is like we have four hours of reconnaissance because the players, it only takes one person to be like the uh, completionist, right? Like to check everything to make sure it's Mm -hmm. totally safe. We you don't want that. Nobody even wants to play when it's totally safe. There's no threat, no risk. You know, and, and, then, and Mission Impossible never started with the legwork. It always started with the mission in progress. And then yeah, as yeah. things will happen, they would then cut away to showing you how they did it. Or like Ocean's yeah, Eleven did yeah, that all the yeah. time, right? Like, like yeah. oh, it looks like they've lost. And they go, ha ha, bum, ba da dum bum, bum, bum. You ever watch Leverage? They do that all <laughs> the goddamn time in every single episode where they think the, the heroes have lost the fight. And then it shows you what they did 20 minutes ago when they actually swapped the briefcase out already and there was already a plan they planned to get caught so that they could make the owner of the art museum look like a fool yeah so you like you're in the same headspace as john harper with the design um he he literally was like i wish we could just jump to the action how do i get players to jump to the action instead of like at the table sometimes spend all this time doing all this stuff and he said okay well if i make it so that you know the action phase is the thing we do and we, we can jump into it by making an engagement role, a group role that tells us whether we walk in and basically an in control position, a risky position or a desperate position. Like, were they yeah. ready for us? Oh, I know. Ready I, I love starting a game where we haven't even started anything. We haven't even played any of our characters and you're in the room and everyone's got their guns pointed at you. Go. <laughs> and, and, and now we're, we're working ourselves backwards. Like if you think again, like every single Mission Impossible movie starts that yep. way with, you know, Ethan already out in the field at the end of his mission as the final shoe is about to drop and the mask is going to get pulled off and the fuse is going to go <laughs> off and the walls are going to explode. You have this big open moment and then you hit the helicopter and then the title card. That's how your game should start. Yeah. In, you know, depending on the game you're playing, but I love games that start that way, where you're just like right in the the water's already boiling by the time you. So the, the flashbacks are just a way to encourage players, like, hey, don't plan, don't prep, don't worry about having every tool you yeah. need because you can just go back later and do it. And if it's something like the like, okay, this building was uh, like armed to blow by terrorists, well, then maybe I'll let you, uh, I'll co- force you to spend a couple appetite. To make it that you took a you know a bomb detonate a detonator disarming trap thing yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah they that press was, the know, button and nothing right. happens. Click right. Click, if it's click, if click. it's too much, like you can charge them, right? Like yeah. to kind of push that back, give have a little pushback. I'm like, wait a minute, that's too much. But like most of the time, it's little stuff. Like oh. Well, of course I brought a shovel. There'd be dead bodies, you know, all all the normal stuff. And it helps then your characters become more professional than your player ever could be because Mm -hmm. your player is, your character is part of that world. They're not going to always be caught on the back foot with their pants down without the right equipment because they're good at what they do and they're the best at what they do. But your player isn't. They don't know anything about this world. They're, They're figuring it out as they go in real time. You have to allow 
the characters to be the professionals. Uh, otherwise, they're just on a all like how many tabletop games have we played where you think you're playing this really badass hero and then you're just kind of turning into bumbling idiots through <laughs> yeah, a series every of time. bad roles or not having the right equipment or not having the right information when, well, no, my character should have had. Why didn't they go into a dungeon with torches? Yeah. Like that doesn't make any sense. Of course they'd have torches. Is that the interesting part of yeah. our story is figuring out why I was dumb? Like, yeah. If it is, then that's fine. Like we're playing that game. But if it's not, then can we like ne- not have to quit talking about? Yeah, right. Like me being a bumbling yeah. fool. So in some some games, it is it it helps the story if you let if you elevate the players and give the characters what they should have. Uh, like you and, mentioned, and, and do you want it to be, be paranoia competent. or Shadowrun? Yeah, you know, like if it's Shadowrun, we're going to assume you're trying to be professionals here. If it's paranoia, then maybe we do talk about how you slip on a banana peel. Like that's okay. Yeah, right? like, well, exactly. Well, I mean, in paranoia, I remember the first time I played it. I was, <laughs> we were in the dark, and the first player who who is the woeful newbie who asks, has "Anyone got a flashlight?" And then everyone's like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! What's a flashlight? That sounds like a commie trick, you terrorist, traitor, mutant!" <laughs> and everyone turns <laughs> and you because like it was dark. I want to. I, 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 and that's just wow. The game gangs up on you if you don't know what you're doing. But yeah. that's part of the comedy of it, right? And yeah. Anyways, uh, so Mitch, you want to tell them about like position and effect because this is like the most core thing, yes. biggest difference. Oh yeah, the I mean main centerpiece of. Oh yeah, no, Wars absolutely. The Dark don't bury the lead. Like, tell tell yeah. us the creme of the. No, creme. We're, we're burying it. You're gonna have to deal with it. <laughs> well, that's okay because you brought your shovel and we're gonna dig it up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Going back, I got my shovel and everything. I, I mean, it, it's one of the, the things that kind of happen uh, in most games in a, a very quick and instinctual way. But Forge in the Dark uh, does it in, in steps uh, because you, you want to communicate to the um, to the player kind of what's happening. And you can kind of adjust things based on uh, people's perceptions and how the story is going. Um, and so like position and effect, you know, you have like standard, uh, well, for like, uh, for the situation, uh, you can go from like risky to like desperate and, and stuff like that. And then like what your position is, are, are you coming into the warehouse where they're doing drugs uh, with only like um a curling iron uh, instead of a gun. You like forgot it at home. And you know, that would be like desperate because then you got to fight a whole gang of marshmallow people uh, with, with nothing but a curling iron. Uh, and so you communicate to the, the character. I feel like You're that like, could be effective because it could be hot. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, tick, just, turn on the heat. Yeah, you communicate to the to the the player. You're like, hey, you know, you're going in this in a very pretty desperate way. So it's a desperate situation. Um, you know, you got a curling iron, so you, you have at least one weapon. So you could either first, give them limited effect. Yeah, yeah, the heat button, effect. great effect against uh-huh. the marshmallow guys. Exactly, and, and so you you kind of go through what. Um, in my opinion, it's kind of like this instinctual conversation that the GM is having by themselves in, in most TTRPGs. And you're bringing the player into it by saying, this is a position that you in, that you are in. Uh, and this is the uh, effect that your character could have on the scene. Um, and let's kind of have a conversation on, I mean, do you, do you agree? This is, this is what we're going. Do you have any perks that kind of alter it? Like the hot shot and stuff is really good sometimes in desperate situations. Situations. And so being in desperate situations is kind of one of the things that they they love to do. So uh, it's just like this. Uh, it, it's a wonderful way to communicate kind of what's going on in the scene uh, and allow your players to engage in it and understand kind of what's at stake. So to sum it up, right, like he, he totally explained it, but usually you have the conversation in your head as a game master. Mm-hmm. This is saying putting it on the table for everyone to see of like, I think the threat I think it's risky because I'm not going to tell you what to roll. You're going to tell me what you want to roll. You're going to say, I'm going to use my guts because I think I'm just running at this headlong. I'm not really really worried about the risk. It's not my training that's speaking here. I just feel like I'm confident that I can chase this guy down. I'm faster than them, better than them. And then I'm like, okay, well, that that's why you picked the action, you know, the attribute you wanted to roll from. And then uh, I tell you that I'm thinking this is risky which is the standard worth rolling sort of middle ground there. And, but I do believe that you're strong and you're faster than this guy. You don't know that. So I'm going to say that you have standard effects, 
But if, if I thought you were like leaps and bounds better than this person, I'm going to say you have great effect. You still got a role, but I'm basically telling you, if you roll and succeed with what you're trying to do, you're going to have a great effect. You're not, not quite a critical, but it's, it's, it's getting closer to that, right? And we're just putting it out in front of you so you can make the choice of how you want to do it. And you, you have an idea of what you're rolling for, which some games do this more than others, right? A lot of games are like, okay, cool, it's guts, roll. But now with this conversation, you can tell me every other part of your character. You can be very descriptive. Well, my character is this power. I have an approach that I'm 100% raw. So when I'm talking to people, I'm very honest. People didn't see that about me. Uh, I carry a gaming laptop. And all of these things, I can then, you're, you're telling the game master all the stuff. And then they go, oh, I'm sorry. You're right. That, that sounds like actually, it sounds like you're actually in control now. And it probably does have a great effect. Um, so you want to roll. So they can talk about what it is they're going for instead of like assuming that the game, the GM's right. And it also puts it in front of everyone else. So everyone else can like, is encouraged to be descriptive, maybe to help to throw in bits and pieces. There's um, a, is there a moment like if you're playing with new players who might not know the system where the light switch goes on and they go, Oh, and they realize just how much they're allowed to. Yes. Um, yeah. involve into the table and, and participate in, in, in helping to set that table. Yeah. Cause yeah. It, right. Immediate, they made a response by some people who were just used to more like, well, cause we know, were just talking, iPhone, I mean, I, I know you're both, you're both in the U S but like here in Canada and parliament, you're not allowed to speak to other politicians across the aisle. You have to speak to the speaker of the house and everything's done in this weird third person. Where you go, oh, geez, the honorable yeah. speaker, please tell the honorable uh, member of parliament <laughs> that they are a beaver's testicles and like that you're not allowed <laughs> to talk directly to them. And I feel like that happens a lot at our tabletop games as well, where mm-hmm. players don't feel like they're allowed to talk to other yeah. players unless they're in character. And when they're out of character, character they have to speak to the gm to then relay information to other people and back and like and it, it 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 works like a like the v instead of the triangle where allowing the players at the table to get excited and and interact with each other and rile each other up and then let the gm just like sit back and watch everyone go yeah yeah i definitely right ideally would be like oh that's risky standard yep up oh, that's you know uh desperate limited effect you know, things that tell it them go, oh, what's well, limited effect? Well, that's like not going to do shit. Uh, what if I did this, this and this? You know, it gives them the opportunity. Yeah, like becomes a negotiation to help yeah. tell the story they really want to tell. Yeah. And, and it, uh, I love that it also rewards like certain styles of play. I mean, going back to that hot shot, like uh, one of one of their perks is like, you know, they, they get a little something extra when they're in that desperate situation. So, you know, you, you're kind of incentivized to be like, all right, I'm going to go in there with this chicken wing and fight these fools. Let's do this. So what Mitch is saying too is like the coolest thing about designing for it is like when you have a comic series that likes to push the pace, that literally has moments where the, the, the protagonists are like, yeah, fuck that. I'm not spending three weeks here. Like I'm going to figure this out right now and I'm going home. Because mm-hmm. like my girlfriend and I are on our honeymoon. This I was interrupted. Just through the yeah, sheer yeah. force of will, they can move the plot along. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so clearly in the comics all the time, especially when these people are kind of above the law, they're taking risky actions. They're taking desperate actions that like players sometimes at a table, especially in like an investigative game where they're used to call a Cthulhu or Delta green or like there's death. It really pushes, it really punishes yeah. you for taking risk. Yeah. In this case, we want to honor that and we want to manipulate that. And Forge in the dark has a system where we can write game mechanics that in, incent- you know, like, if you're the hotshot, you're supposed to be the brash one. Just right? run like, a little bit faster than the speed limit. If you're limit. the prodigy yeah. who's just a natural at things, mm-hmm. we can give you the carrot and the stick that says, like, here's exactly why, when you take these abilities, why the rules work better for you. Cool. Or, or why that's fun. Like, the hotshot also has one where it's like, you get two choices, like a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Like, cool, if you dig in and roll the dice, you can do one. And one of them's like, make something explode. Because yeah. we know that like, <laughs> I, I it was like just one. explosions. Mitch and Pete, um, yeah. I do want to ask, we, we're turning this around really quickly because we want to get this conversation out while the Kickstarter is in, but yeah. would you come back and run this game for me? I really want to play yeah, Chew. I really want to yeah, give it a go. This would be a lot of fun and we'll, we'll find the Anytime. time and we'll, we'll go put it together. Uh, I know like just this month, everything's happening and I'm taking some time off and we're like, oh, 
<laughs> we want to get this out. Uh, speaking of getting it out, and speaking of that Kickstarter, I've, I've had the screen open. I've just been watching the <laughs> yeah. pledges just tick up and tick up and tick up. And that's awesome. What are you hoping to, uh, like, what, what do we have to look forward to uh, over the next few weeks uh, here? on? Like, what are some of those, what, what's your favorite goal that you really want to smash through uh, if people back your project? That you're looking I'm like, ahead at. Mitch, I don't know if I've told you enough of them. <laughs> you can tell me, you can tell me the ones that you hope for, and we'll have some of that conversation. And then we'll, and yeah. we'll create it and we'll put it there. Yeah, I mean, like for me, <laughs> for me, I really want to, I really want to see the the three adventures that I wrote, uh, which is Long Long Man, uh Cock Cock Holster, aka Chicken Ron. Uh, and uh, Hearts Beating uh, Poetry Club. I want them as single issue comics uh, so that when you want to run a game, you're like, oh, it's a little comic book. And it, it is kind of like, it looks like a comic book uh, and, and feels and sounds like one, but it's oh, there to, uh, I know. We it, the last time I ever saw that happen was an old MMO called City of Heroes. And if you oh, subscribe, yeah, yeah. they would mm-hmm. send you comic books in the mail on that month's update to the game, but yeah. it was done in a comic book form oh, instead of incredible. patch notes. Yeah. And and that's kind of like what I really like about, um, I guess like Delta green or call of Cthulhu uh, is I love the adventures that they have. Like the fact that they're, you go to the table and you're like, Oh, here's a plethora of adventures I can grab and buy. And, and yeah, there's all the read. supplemental stuff outside mm-hmm. of the game that you can just consume. That's really exactly. Fun. And I, I I love that. Like, and especially they're sometimes they're small, sometimes they're big. But I, I like I I adore that. Um, and so yeah, I'm hoping for that, uh, Pete. Uh, so so let, let let's have that let's have that be our goal. Um, we. <laughs> we were talking, so we're going to start like the social, sh- the social stretch goal yeah. was that like Mitch has been saying that we need to do like a chew trivia, like online, you know, like do a Twitch yeah. of it or something. So we're, we're just having people like share their backer level as if they ate it because all the backer levels are food, you know, so mm-hmm. it's like spicy chicken wings, mother clucking chicken and waffles. Uh, you know, I got the Szechuan sauce, but I got the chicken nuggets. So ways for people to engage with something that's already like they already yeah. have it. Yeah. People love food on the internet. So like you can drop pictures if you want, you can say how it tastes. What if we're going to keep growing different goals, but the first one's just a hundred. So we already have plenty of backers beyond that to do something with, but um, I really want to bring the creators to Gen Con. Um, yeah. So that, that's a big one for me because I, one part is I think it's funny, like, because we'd have like two kind of like big name comic creators sitting in a booth who like, you know, would be a lot of people would have no idea who they are. But the people who like Chew that are that meet our little Venn diagram yeah. of like the Chew RPG people or the people who geek out because they're like, this is so cool. And they go buy all the comics. They're going to be like, what? They're right there. <laughs> like, what are they doing at Gen Con? And it'll be really fun to be able to do that and just have them at a couple of key places. You know, there might even be other conventions where we see a large amount of backers are in one location. Um, but we've also had backers tell me that what they want is a stretch goal is they'd like a collected cookbook yeah. like from the backers. Oh, yes. Well, I guess a game like this would be best played around a table with a nice big platter of like fried chicken in the center, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, we also, um, uh, we, we, so a lot of the, the one shots come with like a drinking game excellent uh and so like i mean having the ability to so you're pair, so the, the games are already paired up with drinks mm-hmm. drinks and, and it, food sometimes perfect. right like yeah food drinks uh so yeah so it's meant to like you know you know you're gonna bring cheetos and mountain dew to the table anyway uh, but let's just make it more. Some some groups have like the cook, like they eat, they play at the, mm-hmm. the place, the, the game, the game house they play at is because like they always cook. And like what's going to be cool is literally it could be like we know that next session there's like a turkey involved or the mashed potato golems or something. And like I, I love the idea of like how food will actually be at the table and players will be eating and playing and be like, wait a minute. Like, I see what you did there. Like, that'll be that'll be a fun little extra added element. Mm-hmm. So where can people go if they wish to choose their own adventure? Uh, and I've been sitting on that for like half an hour waiting for yeah, you. I'm just going to, I'm just going to ram it down. I'm just going to force feed that to you. Um, 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 but where, where should people go if they want to stay up on the Kickstarter, but also on Pete, what you're doing, Mitch, what you're doing uh, and, uh, and all that jazz where, where should, I mean, it'll be in the show notes, but no one reads the show notes. So uh, let us know where, where can we, uh, where can we stay in touch? Mitch, you can start. 
Yeah, I mean, for for me, you could always find me on Twitter is where I'm most active, Mitch S. Bustios, uh, and I'll be talking all the time about Chu, uh, my experiences running it at Gen Con and Origins, as well as like the writing process and 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 where we are and what like all the cool things you can look forward to um, post Kickstarter and during it. Uh, I'm also like this is the beginning of what will be uh my hope is getting like 40 to 50 uh one shots done before the end of the kickstarter i did this with necrobiotic and i i really want to do it with chew as well so we're i'm i'm scheduling all of the one shots so i'll also be letting people know like if you're interested in a game there is no reason why you can't watch one of these at least <laughs> Yeah, so uh, obviously, as the game publisher, you can go to imagininggames.com uh, if you want to look up some basic information or find links to all the popular places like the Kickstarter page. Um, we do have a Facebook group uh, for, for the Imagining Games, but also for Chew. Um, so if you do want to see like daily content, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll quiet down a little bit uh, over the middle. But like, if you want, you're like, I cannot get enough. Uh, and clearly, you want to follow Mitch and I, whether it's on Twitter or, you know, on Facebook as we kind of forced mm-hmm. to be everywhere these days when you're promoting but uh, and mitch did you say your twitter yeah yes, yeah mitch has right. again i'm at ig underscore pete so that's pretty easy but yeah if you're looking for the game it's chew the role-playing game on kickstarter oh uh, yeah heck yes well thank you for joining us here on meeting the makers i feel like we have met you we know you now and we know your game and and all i mean congratulations on the early success and all the best now in the weeks to come and i'm looking forward to playing this game myself soon we're and so excited to see uh, people play it. it's fun oh, it's so yeah. much fun oh. i have that quiet confidence about it like when i tell people about it there's like not a doubt. Hey, I'm we got to like, have you back when when the Kickstarter is done and the yep, books yep. are out and everything. And like we have to come back for the postmortem to be like, OK, now it's like done. <laughs> uh, the dinner has been served. What has that experience been like to now see it really out in the wild <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and and being it disseminated as that was? I, I that, that, that That's a conversation for the next time. Uh, for now, dear listener, thank you for joining us here on this uh, very quickly edited, turned around episode. Uh, it was very, <laughs> sometimes we do it like that, but sometimes we, rec- we play a game throughout all of August and we slowly drip feed it to you. And that's what the case will be on Tuesday when we're back with our story episode with Simbroom with Mitch as Vaird. And that yeah. is the final episode, Mitch, of the Promised Land campaign. Oh. Chapter five, yeah, Blightborn. Really so uh, it's going down. People were really mad at the cliffhanger this week where it ended with uh, with someone turning into an abomination and then we stop. Yeah. Um, now I'd it, be mad too. We go, oh, but it's so worth it because the beginning of that new episode is going to give you chills when we just go right into it and we just hit it hard and we hit it running right in the action just like I like it. Oh, and, so uh, and no cliffhangers in chapter five because we are wrapping up that story arc before we get ready ready to jump ahead a few months in our mm-hmm. character stories to arriving in Thistlehold. And so that's all coming soon uh, with the beginning of the Wrath of the Warden campaign. Um, so anyway, that's happening on Tuesday. Stick to that. If you don't want to wait until Tuesday and you want to listen to that over the weekend, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash terrible warriors. The episode's up there. You can listen to that juicy, edited, musical, wonderful event. It's, ha- it's, it's there. It's available for you right now, uh, along with um, uh, all the other episodes without me doing intros and extras on them if you want to listen to them so that's that's available in there uh, i also run private games on our patreon page which uh, we do once a month we'll be setting the date for october soon you can still sign up there's room at the table if you want to join us and uh, we uh, i think we're on the fence right now about if we're going to keep with spire if we're going to switch over to simba room because we've got a nice moment where we wrapped up what we were just doing and so uh, uh the, the the players that join get to decide what game we run so uh, uh, we'll follow their lead so you can find all more of that at terrible Warriors.com. You can check the show notes for all the links on Chew and follow us on Twitter at Dice Warriors. I'm off for the weekend. I'm going away on like a Thanksgiving extended week off of work. So we'll see if I can still stay on social media. Probably not. Uh, but for now, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining me, Pete and Mitch, and telling us all about Chew. And uh, we will return to you again on Tuesday with our next episode of Simbroom. And until that time, thank you for listening. Be good to each other.